Okay, great. Um, so if you were here two weeks ago, I um, talked about the how dairies celebrate his anniversaries. Unfortunately, our records, I don't know whether there were celebrations like for our 100th anniversary or anything like that, because um, the church's records, the church in the late 19th century was greatly diminished and there were serious concerns about whether the church just might fold altogether. And um, the congregation members dwindled down to um, five or six people. And, um, and the building, the, the sanctuary that we were using was so um, uh, structurally unsound that it ends up getting torn down. Um, and so as a result, our, our, like our session records were stored at Paxton Church. Jerry has a, a long, long history of partnership, um, particularly in the 18th and 19th centuries of um, sharing a pastor. And so our records were placed in the manse of Paxton Church. And then unfortunately their manse burned down when with it, our records. So we don't have much information about what's happening, we have bits and pieces. Um, some records that weren't at the manse have come to light over the years, but we don't know a whole lot about the church um, during the, 17th, the 18th and 19th century. So the first anniversary that we have records of was our 200th in 1924. And it, um, was a very modest affair. And it was not until the 250th did the anniversary really um, grow into a significant uh, uh, year long celebration. And last week, Debbie Hogue, who was our director of Christian Ed for many years, she retired about three years ago, four years ago. Um, she talked about the trip that the church members and friends of Derry took to uh, Great Britain. They went to London, they went to Ireland, and they went to Scotland. And um, it sounds like it was just a, you know, fascinating trip. And um, that was part of our 275th anniversary. So I wanted to start today talking about what else we did to mark our 275th anniversary, but then I really want to, I'm hoping to have sort of a, you know, discussion and maybe brainstorming session about what, what you would like to see as part of our 300th anniversary, which will happen in 2024, so three years from now. So like I said, the, like the 250th anniversary that was in 1974, Derry planned a year long celebration um, in 1999. Uh, we, the chair of the committee was one of Derry's many, Derry seems to be, I don't know, a haven for retired Presbyterian ministers. And so David Birch, who actually had served as an interim pastor here, before um, Dick Houts was called to be pastor. Um, but um, after a few years, David came back and he was um, he and his wife were active in our congregation. Um, he led the anniversary committee. And so while some of the activities that um, were held during the 250th were kind of repeated with you know, a little twist, there were many new ways to celebrate. And um, so one of the new things that they did that was that the committee um, in session approved, adopted a theme for the year. And I'm gonna start sharing my screen because I have a few slides. So let me go do this and it'll be a little awkward. So just bear with me here. And my guys, there we go. Okay, there we go. So the, they adopted a, um, a theme and it was, Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations, um, Psalm 90, verse one. And the committee also asked Todd Whitman, who um, was a member of Dairy and he was also a graphic designer to create a logo for the anniversary. 
And um, there you can see the logo. Um, the logo featured the session house, which you can sort of you know, get a sense of with the, the glass enclosure that surrounds um, the session house. As a reminder of our beginnings as a congregation, the session house was constructed in 1732. It's the same year that we called our called our first pastor, William Bertram, who um, and started that actually that partnership with Paxton. Um, William Bertram also was called as the pastor of Paxton at the same time. So um, it never served as a, um, what do I wanna say? Never served as you know, a place of worship. It was meant as a pastor study or a classroom, a place, place for the session to meet. Um, session did not meet monthly like we do now. Um, the little, the few records that I've seen, um, it appears that the session was meeting about quarterly. Um, so the, but it's the, it's a very significant building. It's the, the oldest structure in Derry Township. Um, actually today, the glass structure are architecturally is more significant than the house that it, it um, tries to preserve. So um, they were, um, the committee was very ambitious. And so the anniversary celebration kicked off on New Year's Day with a continental breakfast and opening worship, um, which was called the service of covenanting. Actually, the original plan had been to have, um, have the whole event take place later and include a morning brunch. But Penn State was going to play in the Outback Bowl with kickoff at 11 a.m. So as soon as that was known that Penn State would be playing, um, Derry adjusted the timing of their event and, and moved it back so everyone could be home in time for to see Penn State kickoff. And they actually won that game. I did a little research. Um, there were monthly heritage moments during worship. The Vesper series, which we know today as Arts Alive, um, offered um, several, why am I not doing my thing here? There we go. Um, several sort of Irish and Scottish themed presentations, performances. So the first one was in February, um, Barbie Holder performed traditional folk country and Celtic music, Celtic, sorry, Celtic music. And then actually just the following month, um, the Wooster Scott Symphonic Band um, had a, offered a concert here. Now, um, if you had been at last Sunday's presentation by Debbie Hogue, you heard about the travel group's adventures and the amazing time they spent visiting Corimila in Northern Ireland. Corimila is a community that is um, committed to promoting peace between um, North, North and um, Northern and Southern Ireland. And um, this is just an amazing story. And I really want to get more of the pieces because I don't have, I've heard bits and pieces, but I've never taken the time to put them all together. But the pieces, some of the pieces that I do know is that somehow Derry connected with John Hume in um, who, who was the 1998 Nobel Peace Prize winner for his work with Sinn Féin and securing a ceasefire, ceasefire with the IRA that led to the Good Friday Peace Agreement in 1998. And so that same year in 1998, there's this connection, someone in the congregation knew someone who knew John Hume. And um, so Derry connected. And I believe it was that connection that led to the connection with Corey Mila that led to Reverend uh, Trevor Williams that um, Debbie talked about last week. Um, he was the leader of Corey Mila who came to Derry to worship with us and preach on a Sunday in March. So just an amazing, you know, when we talk about, there seem to be so many moments in Derry that of this great serendipity that lead to amazing opportunities. And um, this is another one. We talked a lot about it in terms of um, our new organ, the serendipity of, you know, connecting with the church and, you know, that it fit into the space that we had and it was, 
all, all of those, but here's a really significant um, moment of serendipity that leads to amazing opportunities, not just with Reverend Williams coming to preach here, but opening the door so that dairy, dairy members could go visit Cormila and um, have the opportunity to you know, learn about the, how Cormila is playing a role in, in promoting peace in Ireland. Um, so, but following, let's see, then they had, we had Heritage Sunday, which was celebrated on April 11th. That Sunday, um, the worship followed an 18th century inspired order of worship that actually had been developed by the General Assembly um, uh, from coming out of the, the bicentennial back in 1976. And we invited Peter Sy um, Seibert, who was the, at that time the executive director of the Lancaster County Historic Society to deliver the sermon. And um, Mr. Seibert's presentation discussed aspects of um, 18th century Presbyterian worship in this area, but also um, he talked about the sort of the strengths and weaknesses of Reverend John Elder, um, who, you know, uh, there's so many parts of our church that um, have been named, you know, to recognize John Elder's ministry here. Um, and he was, uh, you know, a very significant pastor, but um, he ta also talked about that, you know, this man was not just like all of us was not perfect and um, talked about the role that he played in the, um, the Indian massacres, he personally didn't, but um, in you know, leading the militia that then create, you know, conducted horrific acts and um, you know, bringing the fact that, you know, you know, just that whole message, I think of, you know, God works with people who aren't perfect. And um, that, you know, just that, I think that's a really important message. We tend to just focus sometimes on just, you know, he was here for 50 years and the church grew under him. But um, I think it's important to realize that we, um, as, a, as a congregation have responsibilities to recognize the less savory, you know, parts of our history as well. So um, after the Heritage Sunday worship, there were exhibits of historic materials in Fellowship Hall. And Don Crawford, who was a member and also a bagpiper, um, participated providing some bagpipe music. The following week, the moderator of the General Assembly, Reverend Douglas Oldenburg, visited and preached um, on Sunday. And they're actually um, the officers of the church and their spouses have the opportunity to um, meet with him over dinner that weekend as well. Now, as Debbie discussed, the Presbyterian Heritage Tour um, took 28 members and friends to England, Scotland, and Ireland in June, um, June 16th to 28th, 1999. What she didn't mention was the months of Sunday school classes that were held to prepare the group for this tour. The classes, which of course were open to all members of the church, covered history, theology, geography, and just you know, focusing on some of the highlights of what the group would see and do. Um, so just they, you know, it wasn't just showing up and getting on a plane and going there. The people that went were really grounded um, in um, to really to be able to really appreciate what they were going to experience on the trip. Um, on July fourth, the um, evangelism and fellowship committee planned an ice cream social with a tour of the cemetery and a patriotic sing along. You can see the cover of the songbook right here. Um, unfortunately, a heat wave kept the number of attendees low. Um, this was really designed as a, a community outreach. Um, so it, I don't know that it was that successful in that way, but it um, tied into the cemetery and the heritage that can be learned through um, visiting the cemetery. In S September, on September 19th, we had um, a homecoming worship and picnic. This is something that um, 
has been happening, well, it happened in 1974, but even in earlier um, celebrations, there were, you know, gatherings and um, invitations to former members to come back and, and be part of dairy for a day. So to get to be able to have this homecoming worship, the committee reviewed lists of past members and worked to determine current addresses so that invitations could be sent. Unlike previous anniversaries, none of Jerry's former pastors were still alive. Unfortunately, Ira, Pastor um, Ira Reed had passed away just the, the preceding year. And um, with, as with past anniversaries, Presbyterian Synod folks were also invited. So it began with worship, with the Quitapahila Bagpipers Band, who then also performed um, at the picnic following worship. Now the picnic um, included a variety of activities. And I love this picture. I mean, I can identify some people. I'm sure you can identify more. You've got Abe Hostetter here on the left. Um, the Donahues are facing him. I see Amy Vance, I see Helen Anthony, a, our, our former um, director of music and organist. Um, I haven't taken a lot of time to look at the people all the way in the back. But, you know, this is, you know, what I love about this is that this is something that we do every year. And um, the, this kind of tradition of, picnicking on the grounds of our church, um, I think is really lovely under the oak trees. There of course were children's games and activities that were led by Gary and Loretta Chubb. Um, they, we planted a, a tree, you can see uh, Reverend Dick Houts, uh, our former pastor um, with the shovel in his hands, the kids um, surrounding the tree. Um, oaks are very important to dairy that I'll, I'll talk about in a little bit. And um, there was also a small time capsule that was placed in the commemorative marker that's by the tree. This tree is located um, outside of the rear eastern door. So if you know if you're coming up Mansion Road and there's um, before you get to the sidewalk, on Dairy Road, there's a little path that takes you to a, a door and it's in that little courtyard area, the, um, this particular oak tree. And what was really fun was that there was a picture taken <laughs> of everyone that was attending the picnic that day. So um, unfortunately, I don't, I've not seen the negative. So um, people, I, this was posted in a heritage note a couple of weeks ago, and there were a number of people saying, you know, oh, I'm over here, I'm over there. Um, they all look just like, you know, little, little stick figures to me. But um, I love this idea of um, taking a photograph of, you know, dairy, representing really present and past and the future with all the children um, because it included former members who had come back to just help celebrate. On World Communion Sunday, um, visitor, I mean, attendees received a bookmark that you can see on the left there with a commemorative communion token. And this was actually um, reusing something that had been created for the 250th. Communion tokens would be given to the tradition up into the, I think at least the 1950s was that, in, and communion was only offered a few times a year, four times a year here at Derry. And so you would go to a preparatory service um, in the days be before communion would be offered. And as a sign that you had properly prepared to receive communion, you would receive um, in the very early years, a token, and then you would bring that with you to worship. Um, I don't know how they collected them, but um, this token, which is of course, you know, a facsimile, the B stands for Bertram, our um, pastor from 1732 to 1740. I think those are the 46. Um, 
and the D stands for dairy. There are other similar tokens that say BP, so it would be Bertram and Paxton, so because he was serving both churches. Um, the final event commemorating the anniversary was offered at worship on uh, December 19th. Um, they, the committee um, authorized music and worship to commission an anthem and it premiered that day. It was a special arrangement of joy to the world for handbell, choir, brass and congregation. And it was um, composed by a woman, her name was um, Cynthia Dobrinsky and um, she was a pretty well known handbell uh, composer. Now, these were some of the big events that were taking place throughout the year, but the committee also pursued several other activities. Uh, the committee had the 1949 um, history booklet reprinted. The committee also um, commissioned a painting of the church by David Lanker and um, had 500 copies prints made. Um, for available for sale that, that were available for $25 a print. Um, I don't know that I would want to consider such a thing again. The in the arc in the church archives, there's probably 250 copies of this uh, of, of this print. So um, it's just, you know, it's it's very large scale. It's you know like 20 by 24. Um, I don't know how many people really want to have a such a large scale image of the church in their home, but it was a really nice idea and it's a it's a lovely image and we get to use it um, when we're talking about the history of the church. But in terms of a moneymaker, I don't think that this is a direction that I would encourage us to go. Um, restoration work was completed on the session house glass enclosure. It seems like we're always doing some kind of restoration work to the glass house. Um, it's an amazing structure, but it's very fragile and um, always seems to need lots of attention. So, but at this point, new lighting was added. Um, so I, there was no lighting before. And um, the session house um, was registered um, by the Presbyterian Historic Society as a historic site. And there's actually a plaque out there that a notice um, noting its status we received. Um, in large part, this was made, all this work was made possible because the Ira Reed family dedicated memorial gifts to the restoration of the session house. Um, Ira and his wife, Winnie Reed, were very interested in the history of Derry and um, Winnie for many, many years really led the charge in terms of researching the, the church's history. Um, the session house and its glass enclosure also um, received the Derry Township Historic Society Award that year. Um, it's something that they do annually. The committee pursued and received notes of commendation from President Clinton, the General Assembly, um, in addition to the recognition from the Presbyterian Historic Society. The committee also pursued several pro other projects or activities that were started, but just were not completed in time to be recognized during the anniversary year. I would say that the, the committee got kind of a late start. They didn't really, start begin planning for the anniversary until just the year prior. So in early 1998, um, they really started, you know, the work of preparing for their 275th. Um, the quilters among the, some of those activities, the quilters began work on an anniversary quilt, um, but unfortunately that was not completed until 2001. Um, the committee also um, wanted to restore the pulpit from the old dairy sanctuary, but the project was delayed and it was not completed and hung in the east transept where if you go enter the sanctuary from the eastern easternmost door, the doors down by the, the choir room and the restrooms. And if you look up, there's a pulpit there. 
And um, that was the pulpit that was used in what was the sanction, the church building was called Old Dairy. This is the one that gets torn down before they build the chapel. Um, there was um, interest uh, about reprising the historical pageant that had been created for the 250th and then actually um, expanded in 1985 and presented again as steadfast as the oak. Um, if you talk to some real longtime members of the church, um, there's great fondness for uh, this story. It tells the story of the history of the church in seven scenes with music that was written by um, Herb Fowler, who was the director of music during that time period. Um, the vision was that they wouldn't try and it was a massive production and required, you know, 100 people to both in front of the stage and back of the stage to pull it off. So they weren't planning an elaborate, they were more imagining sort of a, a reader's theater style with um, some chorus numbers and some dance numbers. However, it was never presented. Um, initially, it was postponed to um, April of 2000, but um, it, the pieces just never came together. So as you can see, the year was filled with a variety of events, um, activities that I feel were um, designed to celebrate and preserve our congregation's rich history. Now, we're going to celebrate our 300th anniversary in 2024, and I, I want to stop this screen share, so let me do that. I can figure that out how to do that. Ah, there we go. Okay, great. Um, my hope, all the, all the anniversary celebrations that I have looked at have focused on, you know, celebrating the past, you know, where we've been, what we've achieved, um, you know, the past, the, the ebb and flow of our congregation. Um, but my hope would be that we could both look back, but also look forward, take this anniversary as an opportunity to um, speak not only to who we have been, but what we aspire to be. Um, you know, one of Stevens, um, I guess last year's, he used this a lot, um, being both rooted and growing in faith and service to God. And so what I'd like to do now is um, hear from you what you think would be meaningful in celebrating and honoring 300 years of being Presbyterian and witness to our faith in Christ. So um, I will, I guess I, question number one is, you know, how do you feel about that idea about taking the year, not just to look at our past, but maybe imagine, you know, what do we aspire to be and how can we begin to move that way? Or if you have something else to say. <laughs> I'll jump in, I'll jump in, Pam. Uh, I thought it'd be a nice idea having a time capsule that if individual members of the congregation might want to write up a narrative about their experiences at Derry, that that would be a good idea. So, so the congregation can actually participate if they wish to. I'm taking notes. What is the role? So Derry's got a, a long history of mission. Um, in the you know in the earliest years, it was you know sending money to missionaries. You know it, it's definitely evolved in the last you know fifty years. Um, but what role do you see mission playing in an anniversary celebration? Hi, this is Miera Kui. Hi. Um, 
thank you for, the, for this presentation. I'm a fairly new member to the church. And so it was helpful to hear about what Derry's done before. Um, I'll, sorry? <laughs> Exactly just ignore them. It's just the peanut gallery. Okay. Um, <laughs> I, I'm very inspired by what you're talking about, like thinking about like who we aspire to be in as we move forward. And I think that does connect a lot to mission. Um, something I've been thinking about, um, and I really appreciate that in the 1970, or you said the 275th anniversary that there was acknowledgement of the role that like John Elder, for example, had had played that we could, we had, that there was acknowledgement of that piece of our history. Um, and I think about like, as we move forward, think about who we aspire to be and even missions. I wonder if it would be helpful to do more of that kind of reflection, um, like thinking about I've been involved in a few learning tours about um, the history of Native Americans in, in this area, and some of which John Elder's name has come up in, in that part of the history. But even thinking about like, could we, could we do some learning tours where we really dig in deeper to that history and then our connections there and spend some time thinking about then too, what do we do with that? Like, how do we acknowledge that part of our history? But then what does it mean you know, with the complicity that our church has historically, like in, in that piece of it and, and perhaps in other places, but but what do we do with that? What does it mean to move forward and think about who we aspire to be? What kind of repentance repair might be needed? I would just love to see some longer like learning and then conversations about that piece. And I think that connects to mission. If, if a lot of our focus is on peace and justice, then how do we have integrity in that? Like with really coming to terms with who we are and thinking then about how we move forward um, to repair, um, go beyond just you know, donating, but to things, but, but how do we truly work toward repair? So I don't know, a lot of, I, I, I like this, these connections, but I'd love to see us do more of, of that piece in, the, in this um, anniversary year. Great, thank you. I'm just writing a lot here. I like what you said, you know, beyond money that um, that's very important that, um, and, and the idea of taking the opportunity for, you know, learning opportunities. Um, I know there's a great deal of interest in having another trip to um, Great Britain, but you know, that's not affordable to everyone. So to create, there's so much here in our area that we could, you know, create, travel opportunities as learning opportunities. And I think that's a really great idea. Thanks, Mara. Yeah. I like the concept that you had on the 275th, I think as it was, where a month was devoted to each celebration type thing. Uh, mm -hmm. And I like the idea of having important people visit us to kind of bring in from the outside another perspective. We're here, we've grown uh, and we're growing, but are we growing in, you know, do we have control in which way we grow? If you know what I mean. I, I, and I, I like the idea of maybe a, some other historical people coming in with backgrounds similar to ours, but that have done different things and how they got there. And I like the, I like the, uh, I'm thinking of, we had talked earlier, uh, how's the church in, uh, or some of the older churches that we are, how are they weathering the storm? How are they surviving? And what are they doing in, in their life? And then look at some new churches that have developed that are doing some even more dramatic things than we are. What are they doing different than what we're doing? I know we're heavily involved in lots of mission work, but are we really involved in mission work or are we just dabbling? That's just a question. That's a, that's a built question. And how would you go about, you know, in terms of you said important people visiting us, how would you go about determining, you know, who you would want to invite? I'm sure there are people within our church 
that know people similar to uh, when we had uh, Richard Hume visit us that are associated with government or other governments or United Nations that have roles to play, are playing a role and how that could, how, how that could impact us. Uh, we have some, through the hospital, there are hospitals do this. They have fellowships and et cetera with uh, people that are involved in various research. And they take, they, they communicate themselves. I'm sure that we could do something similar if we just would ask the pro ask people for mm -hmm. contacts and then go forward. I find that most times you you get response from people if you have the courage to ask. Okay. We we tend to not want to do that because we don't want to impose. Well, if we have a good enough reason, you can ask anybody to do something. The most they can do is say no. But at least you've asked. You planted a seed. Right. Okay. Um, I know that um, Dick Hand um, is very interested in, you know, creating um, some arts, you know, structuring the Arts Alive program for that year to include um, performances that, you know, speak to our heritage. Would you offer him, does, and this is for everyone, um, you know, should we use that as an opportunity to pursue other aspects? Um, if we are, you know, if we become very committed to exploring our responsibilities, you know, as a congregation um, towards um, um, the, the Native American um, community, um, would we would that be an appropriate opportunity for us to invite um, performers from from the Native American community so that we have an opportunity to learn more a little bit more about you know some aspect of and I don't even know how you begin to decide you know what tribes do you pursue because there are so many different cultures represented by you know the the many tribes that live in the, you know, the United States. So I'm just throwing that out there as a, what do you think, Dick? Are you, <laughs> sometimes when there's no picture there, I'm like, are you really there or you just walked away? Uh, no, I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I think that's a good idea. And another thought was uh, maybe uh, some group from Northern Ireland uh, could, could come over here. We don't know. I think uh, Reverend uh, Steve is going to maybe check that out when he gets over to Northern Ireland, if he gets there. Right. And, but I think you're right. We want to, music's been a very important part of our church over the centuries. And I think in going forward, it's going to also be very important. So I think we need to have a mix of, uh, of both. And uh, I think uh, I never thought of the native uh, area, but that might be something to think about. And, and bring it up over the years and uh, uh, give us some, some good musical um, programs to celebrate uh, the Dairy Presbyterian heritage. We tend to forget, I, you know, just I think as a nation that, um, you know, we, we our, our ancestors, you know, sort of came in with impunity and you know, just decided that, you know, the land that we occupied was just ours for the taking. And the fact that, you know, others were living here before we arrived um, didn't seem to have any, you know, value or standing. And um, I think that's a really hard truth that um, I know that I, you know, have to sort of confront on a more more regular basis than I would like, um, but to you know to really own and accept that, and as Mira said, to you know, is there a way that we can 
you know, repair or make amends for the actions, even though, you know, it's not our actions, we didn't do it, but, you know, our ancestors did this, the people that founded our church did this, and um, I think we need to own that. While we love dairy, you know, there are some aspects of our history that um, are, you know, we would rather just, you know, stick in a closet. And, um, and I think that, you know, for all the wonderful things that dairy does today, um, you know, our, our history is not pure. And we should um, acknowledge that and um, respond to that. Um, I don't know how well the rest of dairy is going to feel about that, but it's, it is something I've been thinking about a lot. Yeah, well, just to add on, I appreciate that with, yeah, thinking about, yeah, yeah, we, even though we haven't been the ones that have necessarily done those specific things, we've benefited from it. And as a church, we've benefited from it. And so how do we go about that? I love the idea of bringing in some musical groups um, from, from some Native American tribes, like as a parent too, thinking about like what, what a beautiful way to try to um, help to teach teach our children too about how just appreciation of that part that cultural richness and and helping to I think helping to tell the story to them too about um the people who were here first and and um our part in in that but anyway just yeah just to affirm that idea with with the musical piece too yeah um let me see. Let me see what else. So there has been some work that's underway already about, so I don't know whether if you're newer to dairy, you may not realize that um, there is actually a spring um, close to our property. If you're on the backside of the church and you look over towards High Point where Hershey Trust Company operates down in, cause it's, you know, there's, we're up, on two hills. And when, if you look down into that um, sort of gully, the golf course, there's kind of a odd small structure base there. And that covers the dairy spring. And so there's been some, some work. It's a very, I think, slow and painful process. Um, and Dick, you might talk, can you talk more to that? Dick Han. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure where we are on it to, uh, as well, but I, I think one thought is to uh, maybe identify it with a plaque somewhere up near the parking lot uh, so that people could go down and uh, can look at uh, where the spring was. I think some there's some very difficult situations with the Hershey uh, company who uses that uh, spring to help to do air conditioning at their plant. So uh, to get them to, we've had some discussion to get them to try to do something with the spring, I think would be very difficult at this point, although I think they're still trying, I think uh, Bill Alexander is trying to, to work something out, but uh, that doesn't look like that's probably gonna happen. But if we could have some kind of a plaque right at the edge of the parking lot that says, this is the spring that, and gives a little dissertation as to what, uh, what it meant to Dairy Church over the years. Um, yeah, so it's, you know, it's, it's a sort of a grounding. It's, it's why we are located where we are because of the, the need for fresh water. Um, it's kind of a fun story that when Milton Hershey came back to this area to build his chocolate factory, he actually for many years rented the spring from the church. The spring used to, you know, um, legally be owned by the church. Um, over the years, it was you know, eventually was sold. Um, to one of the Hershey entities. I must be, I'm not certain because it's on golf course land, it might be part of Hershey Entertainment Resorts or because the water is used by the Hershey company. It might, I don't know, but it says it's no longer owned by us. Um, we sold it to um, Milton Hershey at some point. Um, what about in terms of, um, membership involvement and community outreach. Any suggestions for how we might sell, how my, I, my, my kind of thought is to um, 
sort of challenge each of the committees to, um, you know, propose how they would like to be involved rather than making the, the committee sort of responsible, just as the membership and involvement in the um, 275th anniversary did that ice cream social, um, there are there opportunities for the committees to sort of engage. I think that would be an interesting challenge. I think, is it Mira? Uh, yes. Made a couple of comments that has gotten me, my mind thinking. I am a history buff, no argument. I love to look back, but we're celebrating 300 years. We've been relatively successful. We, we've had our peaks and valleys. I think we need to look to the next peak. And I think, okay, we've had 300 years of history. If we're gonna dwell strictly on what was, we're not gonna change. We're gonna be more of the same. And I think we're in part, and I think we have an opportunity to change. The community is changing around us. Are we gonna change? That's my question. And I think now's the time. This is a great opportunity to challenge people. What will the change be? Where are we going to be in 50 or 100 years? I think that's a magical challenge. And it's important because we have 300 years and we've seen the church rise and fall. Are we going to continue to rise or are we going to fall before another group becomes there? I think it's important to consider. and look at it. And I love the uh, So you're saying that our, so that how will dairy be in 50 or 100 years? How should we how, what steps should we be taking to grow or to change? I love the looking back. I like challenging it. Oh, sorry. We had our screen frozen for about 15 seconds. Um, so I, what I heard Bill say was that he's saying, you know, in addition to, I mean, we, we'll, of course, with anniversaries, you're always, you know, looking back to celebrate what you have done or, you know, just consider what, you know, what your past is. But Bill is saying that, you know, we should be looking forward to what will dairy be in um, 50 or 100 years um, and how should we grow and change? Um, should we, I like that idea of, of what you were talking about earlier about, you know, inviting other, you know, churches and, and Christian organizations that are doing different things and, and seem, you know, exciting and they seem to be really, you know, tapping in and connecting with people. Um, can that be, um, help us in terms of, of considering what possibilities are out there rather than just us having to think of it all up on our own. Yeah. It's an interesting- David, challenge. unmute yourself. Uh, this is David. The other thought I have is um, looking at the context in which we find ourselves where churches are closing all around us. Um, uh, sort of the pessimist side of the same question, you know, where might we be? You know, if we invite someone in that told the story of a church closing, what does that look like? Um, uh, there are academics that uh, are uh, writing books about the demise of, of churches generally, you know, uh, trending and, and uh, I'm thinking of uh, an author, Diana Butler Bass, who's written, you know, what, what's Christianity after religion, if that's our context to where we find ourselves, or maybe in a post-pandemic world, you know, what sort of the pessimist side of the same question, where might we be uh, headed, um, is so, some of the thoughts I'm having. And I guess I would say that um, that story that um, Pastor Stephen told in his sermon, he's used it a couple times um, about, um, you know, a, a young family 
moving to, um, you know, this new, or the past are going to this, this very rapidly growing community and wanting to um, make some changes to, uh, to in, include and encourage all these new people that are coming to the community and the church being saying like, oh, they're only going to be here you know, a couple of years, you know, you know, we can't, you know, that's, that's just not a good use of our resources. And then, um, you know, the pastor then moving on and coming back, you know, 25 years later to discover that the, the church that he, you know, served and was so re resistant to change had ceased to be a church, but it now was a great community center because it would have the best barbecue in the region. Um, and so all sorts of, you know, people were there and engaging with each other and lots of life and laughter and, you know, um, excitement. Um, I think that I, one of the great, um, risks, I think that a church like Derry has is that because we are succeeding and, you know, a, a life filled church right now is that sense of, you know, oh, we can just, you know, we'll always be this way. And to imagine the fact that we are this way because we have had the ability to change and grow and respond to um, the community around us and to continue to grow so that we um, in continue to invite. We're often talked about, you know, what a welcoming church we are, but also, you know, an emphasis on creating programs that really speak to people in our community, not just the members that are here, but um, that we make our, make, we're, we're responsive to changing times, not, not losing, you know, our, the core of who we are, of our, you know, commitment to Christ, but that, that commitment to Christ can be expressed in many ways and that ability to change as the world changes is really important. Um, and I guess that's kind of in our anniversary celebration. I, and I've heard many of you say that, that that really should be at the core of um, looking forward that while our, we, you know, we celebrate and explore our past we're really about the future. We're really about the present and moving to the future. So um, maybe there's some great Bible verse that I don't know that could be a, a theme that would speak to that. So um, anyone else? Where do you guys feel about, um, so we have this, this brief written history. It's, um, it's pretty dry. <laughs> um, what's the feeling about doing a history of a church, of the church? Bill Uffelman, history buff. How would we go about doing that? <laughs> I have no idea. I'm, I'm not a writer. I mean, not even. Uh, there are some old stories that I read in the library of some early synopsis of what the church was and what it became. Uh, I haven't seen anything recently that's changed any of that. I think it would be interesting to have a nice, we, we, we have 300 years of history here. What what happened? Were we just a spot and we, we grew in spite of ourselves? So, you know, it, that'd be interesting to find out. Sounds like something <laughs> that should be headed by the Heritage Committee. <laughs> <laughs> Good point, Jack. Thanks, Jack. Thanks, Jack. <laughs> They have the history buffs, right? Our, our connection, I think our connection with Paxton has never really been used to its fullest. 
And one of the things that, that I would like to see is them brought into our celebration. I mean, um, that our history with them is extensive. And although we mention it a lot, I'm not sure we've really used that. Um, it, 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 is, it is a longstanding history we share. Um, <laughs> we need to bring them into this. Yeah. Okay, um, well, this is great. I, I appreciate all your input, Mira, you and I will talk. Um, I really would. So there, there's a quasi committee for the, the um, Dairy 300 celebration, um, but I am looking for people who, um, you know, care about this and are willing to, you know, not take on everything that we'll do, but, you know, take on pieces of it. So um, I hope that you will, if you're interested, that you will reach out to me. Um, you can always just contact if you don't have my contact information or you don't know how to access the online directory that's, you can get to through our church's website. You can always call the church office and they can give you my contact information. So thank you all for being here. I, um, it's been fun for me to, it's always fun for me to talk about Dairy's history. And um, I enjoy doing those weekly um, heritage notes that pop up in Facebook and Instagram. So if there's a, you know, a question that you have that you think I could find the answer to, let me know. So Jack, I think we're done. Yeah, we're, you know, I, we're supposed to be hard fast at 10 o'clock, so we're just about there. So uh, thank you very much for, uh, for your presentation. Very good. Very nice. Okay.